Hi, everyone, and welcome to the ABCs of Anesthesia podcast. And today we're going to talk about induction drugs. Um, so what we want to get out of this, again, with this series of series of presentations, a series of podcasts, you're just driving to work and you just need to know some really useful practical information for your first couple of weeks in anesthesia. And today we're going to go through induction drugs. So the common induction agents um, that immediately come to mind uh, is propofol, you know, the mainstay of most inductions in this day and age. And again, because the secondary agents such as ketamine, thiopentone, um, midazolam, and then the more rarer stuff that we don't really see, such as etomidate, um, would be the main agents that we would talk about. Yeah, sounds good. So what we'll do, we'll make it practical. We'll tell you the rough doses, uh, you know, that we would prescribe to, onset, offset, then why you'd use it and maybe some of the things to watch out for. And then finally, we'll actually go through some cases. So, you know, we'll go through some representative cases that you'll see time and time again, and then some more specific cases uh, where, you know, your choice of induction agent really could matter and, and your dosing as well. So yeah, let's get cracking. How about, let's, let's start with the most common one, propofol. You're gonna use this day in, day out. Uh, it's just the bread and butter of inductions in anesthesia. Uh, what do you reckon, dose, onset, offset? and why you'd use it and what you need to watch out for. Yeah, so, so propofol is um, you know, a very common drug and very commonly used, as we said before. So a common dose would be about anywhere between kind of one to two, two to three milligrams per kilo. Um, and the onset, as everyone knows, is very quick. So within kind of about 15 to 30 seconds, peak effect is really usually about one to two minutes. Um, and offset with a bolus dose is about kind of you know three to four minutes, up to about five minutes. Um, and as with all, most of the induction agents we're talking about today, it works by increasing um, GABA conductance in the brain. So it creates an overwhelming inhibitory stimulation in the brain. Um, the things to watch out for uh, with propofol, I guess, you know, very commonly cardiac depression, both in terms of ionotropy as well as reduced systemic vascular resistance, um, and then respiratory depression. So you can cause apnea at the higher, um, the higher doses. Um, and also loss of the upper airway reflexes. So both the pharyngeal reflexes as well as the laryngeal reflexes, um, which is you know one of the reasons why we use it sometimes. Mm. That's really interesting. And when, when I think about our job as an ease to this, the reason we have a job is pretty much because our drugs are just really blunt instruments. They're really, really good at getting you off to sleep in this case, but then they have these ridiculously bad side effects. Like, you know, the fact that we, we get you hypnotized, get you sedated, and then your blood pressure drops and your heart function decreases or you become apneic. It's, it's a bit crazy that those side effects just happen every single time in coordination with the, the effects that we really want. So that, that's why we get really good at managing hypertension and airways because the drugs we give for hypnosis, it constantly cause these problems and we get to practice these and keep our patients safe with these techniques. And so, and so I guess the special features, so we've gone through the dosing and the onset offset and the things to worry about. And the special features is that, you know, it is really fast onset, really fast offset. You get this smooth wake up and people, you can, if you run sedation, people just wake up really pleasantly on profile. That's potentially why, you know, it, it has been used as a drug of abuse. Um, and, you know, famously Michael Jackson died because of profile and in, in, inadequate um, monitoring and support airway support afterwards. Uh, so really, and, and also it's a really great predictable onset, offset, smooth wake up. And it's really great if someone's got post-operative nausea and vomiting, you know, you could run this as total intravenous anesthesia or TIVA, and that just decreases your chance of PONV or post-operative nausea and vomiting. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it for propofol, the basics, but we'll get yeah. into some examples later. Um, how about thiopentone? What do you reckon? Yeah, so um, thiopentone is a barbiturate um, class uh, induction agent. So it commonly comes in the form of a, of a yellow powder, which needs to be reconstituted uh, with, um, with water. And uh, a normal dose would be about you know, three to five milligrams per kilo. Um, and I guess the, the most salient things to know about thiopentone are there's um, a more of a... More of a uh, a specific um, defined onset point um, compared to propofol. It's a bit, it's a bit more sudden. And once you've seen it, you, you really know what that mm -hmm. feels like. Yeah. And so it's almost like that blinking of the eyes with a propofol induction doesn't happen. It's the eyes are open and the eyes are closed and they don't open again until the drug wears off. So yeah, you're right. Really de de definitive endpoint with uh, thiopentone. Mm. 
And uh, I guess the, the, the most salient adverse effects, um, sorry, before I go on to that, I guess the, the onset time and duration and offset are very, very similar to propofol. Um, type N2 is probably a little bit faster, you know, minusculely. Um, and, uh, you know, it has the same kind of principles of redistribution as opposed to metabolism for its offset sort of a bolus dose. Now, in terms of the adverse... Does, sorry, um, they do talk about having a hangover effect. So when we used to use prop, uh, diapentin occasionally, people would just wake up a little bit hungover, a little bit sloppier, not, not as awake as after propofol. So that's just one of the things that we, you know, we didn't like about diapentin, I think. Uh, yeah. And that would obviously have implications for, um, you know, uh, neurosurgical patients and things like that, where you want a quick assessment postoperatively. Um, but I guess the most significant adverse effects of, of thiopentone um, is really it's, it's got a much more significant um, cardiodepressive effect. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the, the famous anecdotal story that, you know, more people uh, in Pearl Harbor died from thiopentone induced um, cardiac instability than kind of the bombing itself. Mm. Um, Remarkable story, isn't it? I mean, the fact mm. that, I mean, it probably isn't the fact that they use thiopentone, but the fact that they used you know, if they had propofol, the same thing would have happened. If you use the same dose of thiopentone or the same dose of propofol on people with massive blood loss, you know, this is very, very dangerous. Um, and we're mm -hmm. going to go through some examples in the future for that. Um, yeah, actually, other other interesting, so, you know, cardiovascular instability, re a really big problem with propofol as well as with thiopentone. Um, but have you, ever, have you ever tried to do an LMA with a thiopentone induction? I haven't, but yeah, I've been so. <laughs> told it's very challenging. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't depress the airway reflexes in the, to the same. Like it definitely causes apnea, but you know the patient just isn't as relaxed, and it's very hard to insert the LMA. And I remember one of my first, I was I was a resident, but it would have been my first week, and um, the patient had an egg allergy, and probably wrongly, we were too concerned about propofol, you know, being made from egg lecithin, therefore potentially having an allergic reaction to propofol. So we used thiopentin for just an LMA anesthetic. And it was, it was just the LMA. I mean, the patient was fine, but the LMA just didn't sit properly. And we ended up getting the patient off to sleep, managing to struggle through bag masking the patient, getting them deeper, then the airway re reflexes relaxed. And then we were able to put the LMA in. But what would have been a really straightforward induction with propofol, you know, took, took quite a few more minutes. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you you probably the LMAs probably wouldn't have taken up as, as well as they had, I think, if it wasn't for the coincidental oh, uh, you yeah. know, creation of propofol around the same time because you just could not have um, used LMAs with thiopentone, mm. um, which was the main stir of induction agent at the time. So I, I, I think the story was that at the time the LMAs were released, there was a thiopentone shortage conveniently, and there was a sudden uptake in propofol usage, and people just realized, hey, propofol is a great drug. You can, yeah. you know, do an entire case with a laryngeal mask, and really that, you know, became the mainstay of practice in, in most centers now. Yeah, interesting. Um, I guess the other interesting feature about it, so it, it obviously is fast onset and very effective as a hypnotic. But you can get um, yeah, an isoelectric EEG with barbiturates pretty effectively. And so sometimes with your neurotrauma patients, you sometimes see them on thiopentone infusions just to keep their cerebral metabolic rate as low as possible as a brain protective strategy. But the fact is that, you know, do I, do I ever really give thiopentone? No, I mean, the, 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 the rates of these problems are probably not that great, but the fact is that, you know, the anaphylaxis rate is higher in thiopentone. And if you give it accidentally intraarterially or it, you know, blows up the vein and you suddenly get thiopentin around the skin, that's a lot worse with thiopentin than propofol. It's a lot more painful intraarterially uh, and, you know, dangerous intraarterially with thiopentin as well. Plus the anaphylaxis rate is probably six times higher. It's still very, very low, one in 10,000 versus one in 60,000 with propofol. So again, very low, but still, you know, propofol is such a great drug. <laughs> you can really see why it's gone out of favor. Um, but yeah. but I, I definitely recommend finding a consultant who's comfortable with its use and um, using mm. it once or twice just to get familiarity with it, especially in the lead up to the exam. I think mm -hmm. when you've used these drugs that are a bit less common, it, def it definitely helps you understand the, the pharmacology and the pros and cons. Absolutely. So I guess the, the next agent um, we we're going to talk about is ketamine. So Liru, um, what about ketamine? Onset, offset, things to watch out for, pros and cons. Yeah, sounds good. So ketamine, fantastic drug because it does everything 
in, in one go, really. <laughs> so in terms of dosing, analgesic dosing is very different now. Um, so anal it can be used as an analgesic or a hypnotic. And just quickly with analgesia, as, as, a, as a registrar, it may be the one time that you really get to save the day for a patient. A patient might be in incredible pain uh, that is unmanaged or you know uncontrolled with opioids or strong opioids. And you'll be able to get up there, give a tiny bit of midaz to just ease the patient and stop them remembering any of the problematic hallucinogenic effects of ketamine. And you'll give maybe you know 10 or 20 milligrams of ketamine and the pain will just almost instantly go away. And I've had so much success doing that uh, to you know just treat a patient's pain straight away. It's just one of those most satisfying things that you'll do as an anesthetic registrar, treating a patient with uh, ketamine for their uncontrolled pain. Obviously, make sure you get your advice from your consultants, make sure the patient's monitored as well. Uh, and you know, that's just a rough range of dosing. That said, so analgesic infusions, often anywhere from 0 0.05 to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, maximum maybe 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per hour. You'll get used to running those infusions. Now, let's get to the anesthetic stuff. So for induction, uh, your dose could be anywhere from 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram IV in a really unstable patient, potentially 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and then if you're giving it intramuscularly in some very specific circumstances, say an uncooperative patient um, that, you know, you just need to do a ketamine dart style anesthetic, you may use four or five even milligrams per kilogram. And that, you know, I've seen that done quite a few times, very effectively. Again, you need to have a lot of support and help make sure your supervisor is there with you as you're doing this. Um, so onset is very quick, roughly the same arm to brain circulation time, as they call it. But, you know, the time it takes from the, the drug to get from your arm into the heart and up to your brain, that's as quick as it works. So, you know, 30 second onset. It lasts a bit longer. So one dose may last up to about, you know, 15, 30 minutes. I'm not exactly sure. Um, after induction, often, often this patient is already, you know, anesthetized with other agents. So it's, it's hard to tell exactly, but that's probably roughly the time frame. Um, and then, yep, so that's the dose, onset, offset. And yeah, the reasons I'd use this, it's incredibly cardiostable. It's a direct negative inotrope, but it has, you know, indirect symptomimetic effects. And so it kind of keeps the blood pressure stable. That said, in some of the sickest patients, it can, you can still see this drop in you know, blood pressure and, and you got to really watch out for that as well. Uh, so yeah, it's cardiostable, fast onset. Uh, it preserves your airway re reflexes. So sometimes you can do a whole anesthetic with an LMA running just a bit of propofol and a bit of ketamine. And so you might be able to do that. And, and a lot of times in the third world situations, they do that as well as in field anesthesia. Um, as well, it's an analgesic. So it's just got all these really great uses and properties. But the reason we don't use it that often is because of the, of the problems that it is slower offset. Patients might have hallucinations that are quite distressing for some. You get you know, excess salivation. As you're inducing the patient, you might get this uncertain endpoint. You're not really sure if they're awake or asleep or you know, anesthetized because the eyes are still kind of opening and closing, but it's a dissociative anesthetic you know, it works on the NMDA receptor, not GABA. And so you just get this uh, you know, really, really fuzzy endpoint. But there's a lot of reasons why it's great. It does everything, pain, anal analgesia, stable, all of that preserves your respiration at, at smaller doses, but, you know, it, it, it's a bit slower. Propofol is a much needed drug in the, you know, the high turnover situation and in most, for most of your patients. Exactly. And, and ketamine is the induction agent of choice for a lot of the, um, a lot of, uh, in an ambulance paramedic staff as well as done in ED because of its cardiac stability. Um, and, and really, you know, it, it's, it's quite interesting because it's not a drug. I think most anesthetists would be quite comfortable inducing most patients with, with a little bit of propofol because it is much clearer endpoint. You know when the patient's asleep. It's very predictable um, pharmacodynamic effects in the cardiovascular system. And we're, we're very comfortable, I think, you know, generally managing them. And, and really... Um, I think in these kind of sick patients, uh, you you want to be able to titrate to make sure that they don't have any awareness when you're intubating. And with ketamine, it is always quite difficult. And another salient, I guess, special feature point about ketamine is in a patient who's very unwell, who's quite hypovolemic, um, septic, for example, or, or a trauma patient when they potentially might have maximal sympathetic stimulation already where their sympathetic system is just firing, trying to maintain their blood pressure and their heart rate and the cardiac output. Ketamine can actually cause cardiac depression. So as Larry alluded to, ketamine is a 
direct negative inotrope. And it's, it's usually counteracted by the fact that centrally it increases sympathetic outflow. So if you're already gunning and, and your sympathetic outflow is maximally activated and um, you have no more scope for that to increase and you add an agent which is a direct negative inotrope, you're actually going to drop the, drop the blood pressure. And that's, I think, a, quite a finesse point, um, which is why I, I do personally find it really challenging to use it in, in, a, in a trauma patient or in ED when you don't know kind of what's happened and, and what the what the physiology is um i haven't actually seen that to be honest i think it's a theoretical risk i don't know if you've ever uh, yeah, yeah. That. i've definitely seen it so i'll, I'll do yeah. ketamine inductions for almost all my sick patients uh, especially the blood loss cases and you know they they drop their blood pressure um and i've, I've always got to have ephedrine and iramine ready um and in terms of I often combine it with midazolam you know if you're really worried about whether you're going to intubate the patient and you're not really sure the end point the, the, the secret is either give some midazolam so you've covered it, you know, in a, in a multimodal way. And midazolam, as we'll go on to say, is very cardiostable as well. And also you can just time it, you know, if you've, if you've taken 30 seconds to a minute, you, you know, you should be pretty comfortable that the patient's asleep. And again, make sure you're, you're working with someone who's very familiar before you do this. Mm, that's great advice about the midazolam. I will adopt that to my practice. <laughs> so I guess the next agent um, is midazolam. So same drill, the hero. What can you tell us about Medaz? It's often used in sedation because it's it's very forgiving. It's got a much larger therapeutic range than propofol. For example, you give a dose of say fifty of propofol uh, for sedation. Uh, you know, let's say in just an average twenty year old person, they're not gonna they're not gonna generally become apneic. But then occasionally a little bit more, and they do become apneic. Plus with opioids on board. But with midazolam, you know, you could give one, three, even five milligrams in a twenty year old and they're not likely to stop their respiration suddenly, like like with um, propofol. So it's it's much more forgiving agent. That said, so when we talk about inductions, in some in in the sickest patients, if you give anywhere from three to five milligrams of midazolam, in elderly sick patients, they will, you know, essentially fall fall asleep. They'll they'll essentially be anesthetized, um, and it can be very very effective at th those kind of doses. So roughly, I'd say the dose range is roughly in a 0.05 to 0.1 milligram per kilogram. The onset is pretty quick. I'd say, you know, within a minute or two, you see pretty, you know, substantial effects and, you know, marginally slower than propofol. Its ultimate efficacy is probably less than propofol, but in the sick elderly patients, that probably doesn't matter. Um, and then the, you know, the duration is pretty quick, depends on the dosing, depends on repeat dosing, but you'd expect that a, a dose of, you know, three to five milligrams could last up to about half an hour and tailor off in that last 15 minutes. Yeah. And, and again, the special features, it's, it's got a large therapeutic window. It's very cardio stable and I would use it pretty commonly for the, you know, those patients that just need general sedation and I want it to last a little bit longer than propofol. So I don't have to run an infusion of it. Uh, and I'd also use it for those patients who are really sick and, you know, I give a bit of midaz. And I know that they're going to be pretty well hypnotized for the, for the case. Um, but, you know, one of the things that it's a disadvantage, it does last a lot longer and it's got a low efficacy. So you're not going to get the same level of confidence about the patient's amnesia and hypnosis as with propofol, thiopentone and ketamine. So Kaz, um, Etomidate, it's not a drug we have in Australia, but we do have it in New Zealand. It's part of the ANSCA curriculum. Uh, tell us about that because you've just done your first, first part. So you probably know a bit more about this than I do, uh, even though, Either you know, we we both have not used this medication before, uh, but yeah, tell us about etomidate. Yeah, so so etomidate is another um, induction agent. It, it similarly works via increasing GABA conductance. Um, so similarly to a lot of the other agents we've spoken about, it's it's fast acting, short acting, so short duration, um, and its generally dose is about 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 milligrams per kilo. So roughly, if you're anesthetizing, you know, this mythical 70 kilogram patient that we always talk about, um, you would give it between about 15 to 20, 20 milligrams. Mm -hmm. um, quite, quite importantly, it's prepared with 35% propylene glycol, so it can cause burns. Um, so there is quite significant pain on injection, uh, which I guess is, you know, quite similar to a lot of the other agents we've spoken about today. The most salient things about automated that I remember learning, which I, which I think is why it's still used in, in some places, is it's, it's, it's very cardiac and respiratory stable. So there's minimal cardiovascular depression with induction. It's a minimal effect on all heart rate, BP, cardiac output. 
um, and you do have preservation of your baroreceptor reflex. Um, so it's, it's superior to some of the other agents in that way. And there's less depression um, of the respiratory system, even compared to sodium pipental. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons it's used. Some of the some of the adverse effects, which I think is why we, we don't see it as often, um, is you know it's got significant postoperative nausea, vomiting, um, the pain on injection, which we spoke about, and really the the key point, if you want to remember one thing about etomidate, is it causes adrenal suppression. This can be minor, but in quite unwell patients, that suppression of the adrenal response can be quite significant, um, and this is via if you remember your. Um, you know, your, your, your cortisol synthesis pathway, it's by inhibition of the 11-beta-hydroxylase enzyme. So you get reduced both cortisol um, as well as your mineral corticoids, your aldosterone production. Mm -hmm. um, and then you always learn, avoid an acute intermittent porphyria. I've never had a patient <laughs> with acute intermittent porphyria. I don't really think I understand what it is, but <laughs> something you always say for the exam. Mm. Um, and yeah, similarly, nice. you know... <laughs> fast rapid awakening and i think that's really all you all you need to know about etomidate um but if anyone has experience using it um you know we'd love to hear about it and some mm. special points that aren't in the textbooks um would be really interesting absolutely and everyone who i know who has used it you know often people from new zealand uh they, they just love it i think it's just one of those drugs is just really easy to use and kind of a no-brainer when it comes to sick induction so everything's just stable patients asleep and then the problem of adrenal suppression, I don't have to deal with someone else has to deal with that later. So uh, it, it, everyone who's talked about it to me has been a massive fan of it. Um, but let's move on. So we've covered the agents, but let's quickly go through metabolites and, you know, what, what, to, what to watch out for. Um, so Kaz, what do you reckon? Yeah. So um, we'll start off with, um, I guess, uh, you know, when to, when to alter your dose or to reconsider the usage of the drug in either hepatic or renal failure. So, so propofol has both hepatic and extra hepatic metabolism. Um, the, the metabolites are, are broadly inactive. So um, you have a tri-exponential um, excretion, which doesn't really have much relevance to us. Um, so you can use it in both hepatic and renal failure really comfortably. So those are a whole lot of fancy terms, uh, but essentially anyone's got renal failure, anyone's got hepatic failure, I, everyone still uses it. It's not a problem. Don't worry about it. Propofol is your drug for organ impairment. I love it. I, lo I love the Cliff's notes, Lahiru. I uh, really good. <laughs> um, so, so thiopentone uh, is metabolized by the liver, um, and it's got a really fancy, um, you know, a concept of nonlinear kinetics in terms of metabolism. Not really relevant. The main thing is it has pentobarbital as a metabolite, which is active. So um, you can have increased duration. So in patients with um, renal failure, you need to be mindful that you can have an increased duration of action because of the pent pentobarbital metabolite. Um, ketamine is also hepatically metabolized into norketamine, which is then further metabolized into an active in in, um, act inactive metabolite. Sorry. Um, norketamine can accumulate in renal failure, um, but generally it's, it's pretty safe in renal failure. I think you have to get to quite severe renal disease before you start dose adjusting. Mm -hmm. Um, midazolam, again, is partially metabolized hepatically to exazepam, um, which is, as you know, active because it is a drug we make. Um, and you get renal elimination of um, almost all of the metabolites. So you need to be quite mindful of dose adjusting in patients who have severe renal failure. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually not too sure about Atomidate. No, that's all right. Um, so I think that's a really good summary. It's really practical for most people to just know when and when not to use it. But really, the, the simple formula is any organ impairment, just use propofol. And you won't have to worry too much. Um, and generally, so I mean, I didn't know this until really getting into my part one study. The fact that most drugs are hepatically metabolized, like you know, mm. that the liver is just the way lipid soluble drugs become the, the body converts them to more water soluble to get rid of them. And most of the time, when it converts it through its you know phase one and phase two reactions it doesn't produce an active metabolite, but every now and again, it does like, you know, with morphine and with ketamine and with midazolam. And that's when you got to worry about the renal impairment, but the, you know, the dummy's guide to metabolism is everything's <laughs> hepatically metabolized, usually not to active substances. And if it is active, you better know about it because then in renal failure, it matters. And so that's just the real dummy's guide to understanding what the body's doing and what to, what to watch out for. 
Excellent. So I, think, I think those are most of the agents we want to talk about. And I think we were going to go through some uh, yeah. case discussions here. Yeah. So, so what we do is we maybe go through the most common cases that you'll get. So two relaxed and general anesthetic cases, just ima imagine all of these patients are 70 kilos. Uh, so a, a relaxed and general anesthetic for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy in say just a, a 50 year old person. Um, then an elderly laparoscopic cholecystectomy, say they're 70 or 80 years old. Uh, so now you've got these two situations, the, the general one and the older, more fragile patient. Then you've got an LMA anesthetic, so a non-relaxant anesthetic. I'm not giving muscle paralysis uh, for these cases. So a cystoscopy in a 20-year-old. Um, so they're young, fit well. Again, let's say they're 70 kilos. And then a cystoscopy with an LMA in a 60-year-old patient. Um, so, you, you know, maybe you're a bit more worried that don't have as much resilience to these drugs or reserve to combat the cardiovascular problems with these drugs. So those are the four most common uses of, say, propofol that you get. And the four commonest cases you would get in practice, uh, which you could then translate to most other relaxant or non-relaxant anesthetics. And finally, we'll go through a hypervolemic shock induction and how do you induce someone or what drugs do you, would you use to induce someone for really bad heart failure? So imagine an, a patient with an ischemic cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of you know, 10%, 15, 20%. And I've, I've, I've done a few of these cases and you know, you're really worried. They've got very little heart function. And as you realize, most of our drugs will just depress that and make everything bad for their cardiovascular status. So you've got a Again, everyone 70 kilos, just for the, so we can give you some actual dosage. Uh, a 40-year-old, 40, 50-year-old 40 patient for a lap collie. What do you give induction-wise for, for this? Hmm. So in most cases, we would use propofol for a patient, for you know, most of our cases. So in an otherwise healthy, well um, person, you'd be thinking about kind of two to three milligrams per kilo. Um, so you'd want a adequate dose to get them off to sleep quickly and also um, a, a dose that's that's safe from a cardiovascular perspective. Yeah, great. So, I, I mean, I'd, I'd literally give about 150 milligrams mm -hmm. and maybe titrate to effect. So you might want to give another 50 depending on how they respond because everyone respond, responds slightly differently. As always, you know, you do these inductions supervised and you have everything ready. I mean, if, if the blood pressure drops, you can give aramine and you've predicted the problems that you're going to get. So I guess for the, you know, the next patient we want is, is a, an elderly patient, say 80, 85 uh, years old, who's getting a, who's getting a lap collie, who's, you know, a standard 70 kg weight. What kind of doses would you use here? Yeah. So with, with, with this patient, you just know they have a lot less reserve. And so generally speaking, I'd, you know, err on the side of caution with these patients, anywhere from 0.5 to one milligram per kilogram. But literally in these patients, uh, I would start with say 50 milligrams or something around that amount. And then I can titrate it to effect. I can give, you know, extra doses and I'm just taking everything really slowly. And I know that the blood pressure could drop substantially. And so I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, I might combine with a bit of midazolam as a sparing effect. I might give more fentanyl to spare the profile as well, but either way, I'm giving much lower doses. The fact that they're elderly, the fact that they've got less brain tissue and more, you know, less central volume and more of this agent is going to affect their heart. And, uh, and lung function means that I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go really slowly with these patients. Uh, and I know that I don't need too much anesthetic to get them hypnotized and the relaxant will keep them paralyzed for the, for, for the case. So I don't, yeah. So essentially I, I don't need much for these patients to have them anesthetized well. Hmm. And I think the key thing here, which um, a practical point that it took me a while to learn was you, you really do need to give the propofol a bit more time to work in these patients. So, you know, they have, they have a slower arm to brain circulation time. They do, do take a while. So often you, you might give, you know, a 0.5 milligrams per kilo dose, but you end up topping it up because you, you're not waiting long enough, but really being patient, giving a little bit, waiting for a bit of a response and titrating as you need it, starting giving a lot less is, is so much safer in these patients. Um, but patience is a virtue when it comes to this population. That's a really good tip. It, everything, everything thing takes a lot longer in these patients. In fact, and when you give the aramine to drop, you know, to prop up that blood pressure, that will also take a while. So don't go chasing with another dose because suddenly you'll get a blood pressure of two hundred because you weren't patient enough. Um, so no, that, that's a really good tip. Uh, don't go chasing waterfalls, Lahir. 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> so the next case. Uh, now this is a non-relaxing general anesthetic. So cystoscopy. Uh, all you need is an LMA, and you don't need to give relaxant in a twenty-year-old, seventy-kilo patient. What would you? What would you do? So in these LMA cases, we are not going to paralyze this patient. So you really want an adequate dose to both provide hypnosis as well as depress the laryngeal and pharyngeal reflexes. So. In, in this scenario, one of the things that I was told when I was quite junior is, you know, you always get into trouble not giving enough um, propofol in the young, healthy patient and, you know, conversely in the older patient by giving too much. So in this sort of a scenario, I'd be thinking, you know, somewhere around kind of 300 milligrams per kilo. So we're getting much more into that three sorry. milligrams, sorry, so 300 milligrams as a, as a dose and uh, more into the three milligrams per kilo range. Um, for this sort of a case. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so I remember some of the first anesthetics I looked at, these patients were being given big doses. And I, I was quite you know, sh amazed by that. But yeah, you, the, the you know, young patients of a normal size are just so resilient that they will cope with these big amounts of medications. And again, you want to you want to be cautious. You're you know, you're doing anesthetics, everything happens very quickly. So even though I know I'm going to give big doses, I'm ready to cycle the blood pressure, I'm checking all the variables, maybe they've got some other condition that I, need, I, I don't know about, and I've got to be very vigilant. But overall, it's exactly what you said, you get into far more problems with a young patient like this too light than too deep. If they're too light, you can't get the you can't manage the airway, they might learn spasm, they might, you know, move around and, you know, cough and buck, as they say, and maybe even aspirate. Uh, whereas if that, that's their light, if I just give them too much medication, most that they'll probably have is just a degree of hypotension, and I just give it a dose of aramine. So much easier to fix than having to give succinamethonium for laryngospasm and intubate this patient. Mm. Yeah. And once you've had a young, fit male have laryngospasm because you've underdosed the propofol, you you learn your lesson pretty quickly. It's, it's pretty <laughs> harrowing and and you know relatively challenging to manage um, if you're by yourself. That's right. So the next patient in this category is a 60 year old um, patient with the same weight, 70 kilograms, who's having a cystoscopy. What would your approach be to dosing here? Yeah, I actually find these a little bit trickier to dose because on one hand, you know, you need to give enough propofol to have the, or the airway reflex ablated. So you're using propofol as a hypnotic, but also as a pseudo paralytic agent. So I need to give more propofol than I would for in these patients if I was also giving paralysis. But then they, they, they might be 60 with some unknown other issues, some you know, cardiovascular instability or you know, ischemic heart disease or something like that. So I find that these are a bit trickier. So I generally tend to give you know, a, a, a fullish dose, say anywhere from you know, about 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, so say 100 milligrams in this patient. Uh, but then I'm always concerned that maybe it's going to drop the blood pressure. And sometimes I, it's not enough. Maybe I need to give another 50. So I, I generally with these patients give that 100 maybe top it up with another 50 milligrams of propofol. And then I'll try to bag mask and get the volatile up if they're not, um, you know, any size straight away. And I'm always, again, watching for the blood pressure drop and treating that as, as required. Now, so this patient, you know, the 60-year-old, it's, it's, it's just a bit more complex because I can't just give them the 300 milligrams to ablate everything because, you know, I'm worried about that stuff. Whereas when I get the 80-year-old patients, they, they often are all very susceptible uh, to the anesthetic. So even, even 50 milligrams in 80-year-old patients for an LMA seems, seems to be okay. And I might need to top up with another you know, 20, 30, maybe 50 milligrams slowly. Um, so yeah, those are kind of very different situations and how I dose these mm -hmm. patients. Uh, and hopefully over, over your rotations, you'll be able to translate these patterns of young and elderly relaxed and general anesthetic and young and elderly LMA, non-relaxant anesthetic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a really interesting point, which um, I think would be, would be useful for people starting out is, you know, airways are really fun. It's really fun to intubate. It's really fun to learn how to intubate. Um, and that's something a lot of residents tend to focus on. But if you are going to pursue anesthesia as a career, and particularly if you're kind of someone in ED or ICU coming to anesthesia, I actually think you, you learn a lot from asking to give the drugs and learning how to how to dose medications and i'm at a point of this as a first year um, because you know after a while you know you can intubate most patients and really you want to you want to learn how to dose these medications and, it, and it's, it's such a involved nuanced process with so many variables and you really want to get that experience while you have a consultant with you for most of your cases um, so i would really recommend you know every second case swap swap with the consultant and ask if you can dose the drugs and, and try to get a feel for how these drugs work, the time to wait, how do you top it up, 
et cetera. That's a really great tip. I wish I'd done that so much earlier. I think the first time a, 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 the consultant actually told me, hey, you should probably have a go doing both the drugs and the airway because that's actually quite tricky. I was like, what are you talking about? What, what is this magic that I can actually yeah. do drugs? So, you know, yeah. maybe, what is it? Maybe after you've done a few weeks, oh, probably, probably more, you, you probably do want to focus on your airway. So maybe after you've done three months of anesthetics, maybe yeah. before, maybe after, see how you go, just try to swap roles and just get a feel for how, how you have to give these medications. Oh, also do lots of sedation lists when you're starting out because that's mm. the consultant will definitely offload that to you. You will be able to dose and get familiarity with propofol and other medications all by yourself and repeat and, you know, rinse, repeat and practice over and over again that, that technique as well. Mm. When I was in a rural center and, I, and, I, and we did sedation by predominantly bolusing just because that was the yeah. culture, you really get an idea for how much pop for someone needs yeah. and also no learning how to wait wait long enough for the drug to work. I, that really gives you a good feeling for the pharmacokinetics, which is um, invaluable. Yeah, that's right. Hey, so let's move on. So now there's a couple of, uh, I, I call these the critical inductions. So I've, got, uh, I've, got, I've got a worksheet on the website, which I might try to put a link in below so there's only a few cardiovascularly relevant or critical inductions and the, the ones that we can go through now are hypervolemic shock induction and the really bad heart failure induction so tell me about let's say you have a you know 40 year old patient 70 kilos again hypervolemic shock so they've had a motor vehicle accident they've lost maybe three even four liters of blood they're pretty unstable and you just need to you know the blood's running the fluids are running you have to rush them to theater for laparotomy uh, how do you do that really, really tricky high risk induction? Yeah, look, very, very complicated answer. And I think there's multiple ways of approaching this. My, um, my I guess one approach would be to use propofol. So, so the relevant physiological factors here are they've, they've lost three liters of blood. So their the central plasma volume is much lower. They're potentially obtunded either because of shock or because of the hypervolemia. So you actually don't need as much drug to make them um, to make them asleep or make them amnestic. Um, and then I guess the third point is the cardiovascular instability. Um, so whatever you give will have a much more profound effect on this patient who's really holding on by the by the grace of their sympathetic nervous system. <laughs> um, so you know, in, in this sort of patient, I think it's not uncommon to give what would seem like a homeopathic dose of propofol. So, you know, two, three milli milliliters. So, you know, 30, yeah. 30 milligrams of propofol um, is, is usually sufficient. I've, I've done some of these cases with one mil of propofol. Mm. Um, and, that's, and, and that's really enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know that they're going to drop their blood pressure. So everything that you do is to prevent this happening. You've got your art line, you've got your big drip and the fluid and blood running. The surgeon might be prepped, draped, ready to get in there and try to cross clamp whatever vessels bleeding out. And you've got your aramine, ephedrine, and maybe even adrenaline. And mm -hmm. just to just to be extra careful that crash cut might be in the room because you never know how bad it's going to be. Uh, so I know I completely agree with you. I may give anywhere from one to three mils of propofol if I'm if I'm forced to use propofol. Um, but I, I would agree, and and that seems remarkable. Like what, what you know, what are we talking about? You, you gave for this, you know. To a 20 year old you gave 300 milligrams and now you're giving 10 milligrams that's not a trivial difference uh, and hopefully hopefully a lot of these patients don't come in but if, if you are forced to treat these patients ask the anesthetist you know what are you giving how do you decide that and explore explore the um the reason for giving such a low dose hmm. and this is also one of the scenarios where the where the fellow or the consultant will insist they do the drugs because mm -hmm. you know it, it is a more difficult part of part of the situation yes um so I guess I guess the other things you could do. So other medications, um, hmm. medications you could use. So a ketamine induction, as we spoke about, has that added benefit of um, cardiac stability. But you, as you spoke about, you just think about that direct kind of negative inotropic effect. What kind of um, doses would you use here, Lahiru? I don't have as much experience in this. Yeah, so I'd often use about the 0.5 to one milligram per kilogram. I know a lot of my colleagues would generally dose into the one milligram per kilogram range. I just know that I've had pretty severe hypertension, even with 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. So often I'd combine this with midaz and I'd give some midaz and maybe 30, 40 milligrams of ketamine and give a rapid acting muscle relaxant. So that's probably the range I'd give it in, knowing that these patients will still drop their blood pressure every now and again, even with ketamine. Yeah, yeah. And I guess to a degree, you would, you would probably have so much of tundation if they really have mm -hmm. lost three liters and they haven't been resuscitated mm -hmm. with any IV fluids or blood. 
you can probably get away with a bit of midaz, you know, give yeah. them enough am amnesia and enough sedation and yes. then get the tube in. Um, yes. But I guess, you know, uh, for example, a BIS monitor would be, you know, your friend in these situations because we know that awareness um, is much more likely in kind of trauma and septic patients where you are being a lot more cautious about the drugs you're giving. Mm, that's good. And, yeah, and likewise, you can probably just do this on midazolam as well. Um, you know, this patient's unfasted, so you, you don't want to obtain them too much, but giving two mil, you know, one milligram while you put in an extra line and theater gets set up and then another couple for induction with a biz on, maybe a bit of ketamine. It's just a bit of an art about being familiar with these medications, getting used to giving them and especially getting used to manage the predicted complications. Excellent. All right. Well, the, the next case we want to talk about was, was quite similar. It's about the it's about an induction in a patient with heart failure. So mm -hmm. what would your approach be in this? I guess, what are your priorities? And then what would your approach be? Yeah. So my priorities are... Now, uh, the first thing to say is that this sounds a lot like the hypovolemic shock induction, but the reason why it's so different is in the hypovolemic shock induction, you've just got a general patient. I don't care about tachycardia that much. In fact, I want tachycardia to support the sympathetic nervous system and the, and the blood pressure. So I don't care how much alpha, you know, fentanyl I give, or if I give any fentanyl at all for the hypovolemic shock patients, but for the heart failure patients, I really want everything to be as be normal. So I want normal preload, normal rate, normal contractility, or I don't want any suppression of that. And I want a normal afterload to promote coronary perfusion pressure. So normality is what I'm aiming at. And this is a, probably a you know, slightly trickier induction. Um, you'll often do these patients in it, who are going for cardiac surgery. So, you know, your CAGs, your, even, even, your, even your valve op operations, they're often sick hearts. And so just to give you a bit of a pattern, so I find, you know, midaz and maybe, in, maybe an infusion of propofol running, so it's very little amounts of propofol that are getting in is often what you see happening. For example, as you're putting the lines in, you're putting in, you know, a couple of big drips in art line, you might give a couple, you know, two mils of midaz, uh, maybe another mil of midaz as you're going off, as, as you're starting to pre-oxygenate. And so by the time you get to the actual induction and giving the relaxant, You've probably given anywhere from three to five milligrams of midazolam, maybe one mil of propofol, and that's probably enough for these patients. Whilst you're running some fluid to maintain your preload and giving lots of fentanyl to stop a tachycardia as you go in with your um, laryngoscopy. So these patients, I would always predict that they'll be hypertensive due to vasodilation, venodilation, and depression of the contractility. So I'd have the aramine running, and I'd have ephedrine on hand to just get back to promoting their heart function. So often I see these patients, yep, with a trickler profile, a big dose of midazolam and a massive dose of fentanyl, anywhere from, you know, so for a 70K patient who's maybe what, 80 years old, 60 to 80 years old, easily give them 200, 300, even 400 mics of fentanyl. And again, you'd probably be doing this, you'll definitely be doing this with a consultant and maybe even the cardiac anesthetist who will guide you through these. Well, I think that's probably a good framework of, you know, common and, and potentially sometimes uncommon cases and inductions and the type of doses and considerations um, you'd want to keep in mind. Naturally, I, I think as you progress, you'll, you'll build on this. You know, I'm just kind of starting to add the next layer of the cake and learning a bit of the nuanced stuff. So, um, and I'm sure, you know, even as a consultant, Lahiru, you're still, you know, picking up mm -hmm. things here and there and changing your practice as you go. But hopefully this is a good foundation. So we've what, we, what have we done today? So we've talked about the common induction agents. We've talked about some of the uncommon induction agents, um, common doses and common considerations, as well as what to do in a patient who's got hepatic and or renal disease. Um, and I think importantly, hopefully we've provided some sort of a for, uh, structure and an approach to um, common induction scenarios that you might find. Yeah, that sounds great. So yeah, I think we'll wrap it up there. Hopefully this is useful. Um, again, please write in to us at anesthesiapodcast at gmail.com. Please share with any, anyone who might be interested. And yeah, if you want to if you want to ask about any specific topics that you'd like us to present, please don't hesitate to ask because we'll, we'll try to get something nice and practical out to you. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs> we'll see you next time.